Sometimes give, somebody gives a talk at a DPA conference that's so good that when they come back here this year, 50 people go, I remember your talk, my God. Well, there was somebody who gave a talk last year, two years ago, that just really resonated. And I want to bring him up to give us just a slightly longer talk. I said, you got 10 minutes. This is a guy who is one of my best friends and mentor. He's the longtime former head of the ACLU. He's the chairman of the board of the Drug Policy Alliance. And his name is Ira Glasser. <laughs> If anybody needed to know what we were fighting for, that last presentation was it, right? We're about, <clears throat> we're about freedom, yes. We're a movement for liberty, yes. We're a movement for justice, yes. But we're a movement against what you heard. We're a movement against injustice, and we're a movement against the fundamental and profound immorality of what the drug war has meant. Yeah. I was saying, as I was saying two years ago, the moral arc of the universe is long, very long, too long. But it bends toward justice. It does bend toward justice but it doesn't bend by itself. You gotta get up on top of that arc and lean on it and push on it and sit on it and bend it. It won't bend without us, it won't bend without you. It has bent a long way and there's a long way yet for it to bend, a long way. Paraphrasing Martin Luther King Jr. and what I think was his last speech before he was murdered, in 1968, and people were asking him, well, how long is this fight for racial justice going to take? And you remember from two years ago what I told you he said. He said, how long? Not long, because no injustice can last forever. How long? Not long, because no injustice can last forever. So I was coming out here on the plane uh, Wednesday, and somebody came up to me, as Ethan said, the first of many, and uh, sort of stunned me by recalling that speech from two years ago, and, re and remembered particularly that, that how long, not long refrain, and said to me, well, I guess it wasn't long. Now, you know, Colorado and Washington, and we've won. Well, no, we haven't won not only because that's only two states out of 50, but because it's only one issue out of many. And we haven't won because we haven't... We haven't won because we haven't even consolidated the victories in Colorado and Washington. You know, the fundamental principle of all social justice movements is that no victory ever stays won. You always think, wow, we really won this, and then you forget. You underestimate your adversaries. You underestimate the powers that are aligned against you. You don't remember that they're as smart and as tough and more resourceful than we are, and they fight back. And if you don't protect the victory you won, it unravels. So that is the first step ahead. And then, of course, you have to extend those victories to all the other places that don't yet have them. And then you have to move on to all the other issues, because marijuana legalization ain't enough. <clears throat> so the message at this moment in time is not how long, not long. The message at this moment in time is something that Winston Churchill, of all people, said. Uh, at an early point in World War II, when Britain finally won its first significant battle against the Nazi German war machine, which had seemed unstoppable, 
And everybody was just thrilled and excited and also felt as we may have felt about what happened in Colorado and Washington, wow, we won. And Churchill got on the radio and said, there's every reason to be encouraged by this, but this is not a reason to celebrate. We haven't won. He says, this is not the end of our struggle. This is not even the beginning of the end. But it is, perhaps, the end of the beginning. And that's where we are. We're maybe at the end of the beginning. And while we have every reason to be encouraged by our victories, it is way premature to celebrate. Um, this has been true of all social justice movements. You know, um, as many of you know, uh, I'm a little bit of a baseball nut, and uh, uh, my paradigmatic uh, uh, experience of, of uh, racial justice was being nine years old when Jackie Robinson became the first black ball player um, with the sainted Brooklyn Dodgers in 1947. I say for all you people in Los Angeles, the sainted Brooklyn Dodgers. And, and uh, on April 15th, 1947, when Jackie Robinson stepped onto the field at Ebbets Field, that wasn't the end of the struggle. That wasn't the end of the fight for racial justice in baseball. That wasn't the beginning of the end either. But it was probably the end of the beginning. And there was a lot of struggle that followed it. Seven years later, on May 17, 1954, the United States Supreme Court ruled that separating school children on the basis of skin color was unconstitutional. It was an incredible, pivotal, transformational victory. But it wasn't the end of the struggle for racial justice. Nearly six decades later, that ain't over yet. And it won't be over anytime soon. And it wasn't the beginning of the end, but it was again one of those victories that one could say it was the end of the beginning. A little over a year later, in December of 1955, a woman named Rosa Parks sat down on a bus in Montgomery, Alabama, on a seat that was reserved for whites and was taken off by force. And a then unknown Baptist minister named Martin Luther King Jr. stood up and organized the Montgomery bus boycott in her behalf. And it ended after a long time with the Montgomery bus rules that separated people out by race and relegated blacks to the back of the bus. Uh, it changed those rules. It was a fantastic victory, a spark and ignition to the civil rights movement that followed. But it wasn't the end of the struggle, was it? No, it wasn't. And it wasn't the beginning of the end. But it was an end to the beginning. And in 1972, when the Supreme Court of the United States finally decided that the 14th Amendment promise of equal protection of the laws applied to women, too, and, and, uh, uh, and, and applied to sex discrimination, that was a great transformational moment. But it was hardly the end of that struggle, which isn't over yet. It was hardly even the beginning of the end, but it was perhaps the end of the beginning. And so here we are, and I think we can legitimately say we are at the end of the beginning, and it's been a long, hard fight for many in this room. I often said, you know, it's not the fight for social justice is not a sprint, it's a marathon, but it's not even just a marathon. It's a marathon relay race. And it never ends. And you can't measure progress by the brevity of your own life. Because it feels like a long time when you've been doing it for 35 or 40 years. It does. But what is that? When what you're fighting against has been in place and institutionalized and cemented into the body of the country for hundreds of years. You can't turn that over in 30 or 40 years. It feels like it's long, but you're only running one leg of that race. So what you do, what we all do, 
and it's why it thrills me to see all of you here. Uh, you run that race as hard and as long and as fast and as strategically as you can, and you keep running and you fall down, that's not a sin. It's a sin not to get back up, and you get back up and you keep running, and then at some point, you hand the baton over and other people keep running. And maybe you see the end of the race and maybe you don't see the end of the race. But the race goes on. And I've been running this race a long time. I ain't tired yet. Are you tired? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and we're on a train now, is the way I think of it. We're on a train of drug policy justice. We're on a train and the train has left the station now and it ain't turning back. We're on that train, and the train is unstoppable, I think. And that doesn't mean that we're not gonna suffer defeats, and that doesn't mean that there aren't gonna be obstacles on the tracks, and that doesn't mean that we aren't gonna get our hand, head handed to us on this issue or that issue along the way, but the train is now unstoppable. And that's not because we won marijuana reform in Colorado and Washington. I'll tell you why the train is unstoppable. The train is unstoppable because we're all on it. The, and I've been running this race long enough to know it wasn't always the case that we were all on it. Sometimes most of us weren't in the room at all. Sometimes, very few of us were on it, and the train didn't work real well. <laughs> it needs everybody stoking the fires and steering the train and pushing the train when it gets stuck. And now, it's unstoppable because we're all on it, increasingly so. We have liberals on this train. We have conservatives on this train. Not enough, but we'll get more. Because <laughs> you always have to ask a conservative what exactly it is you're trying to conserve. And, um, and we have libertarians on the train. Yes, we do. And we got, we got formerly incarcerated people on the train. Yes, we do. FIP. And we got people who've been banned from voting because they've been convicted of nonviolent drug offenses. We've got those people on the train. We've got black people and white folks and Latinos on the train. We got a rainbow on the train. And not just individuals. Now we're getting organizations and institutions on the train. We had the NAACP on the train. I tell you, that wasn't always the case. But they're on the train now. And we have women on the train. And we better damn well have women on the train because they're among the most victimized people in this drug war, especially women of color. And we have women on the train who aren't about to let the government use their pregnancy as an excuse to oppress them. And we have students on the train. You know, a lot of social justice movements And they're not quiet, they're not quiet. <laughs> and we have parents on the train, mothers and fathers. Yep. We have harm reductionists on the train. And recovery people. And heroin-insisted treatment folks on the train. And we have AIDS activists on the train. There's a lot of cars in this train, and the people aren't separated. We don't have, you know, these folks in one car and these folks in another car. There's no doors on this car. <laughs> and all of these folks on the train are not passengers. They're all running the train. They're all steering the train. They're all pushing the train. And they're all loud. They make more, more engine noise than the train engine does. And This train is unstoppable. It's going on. It's left the station. 
And now the question is, how long is it going to take to complete this journey? And you know what the answer is. Not long. Oh, right. Uh, now, you know, when I say not long, and when Martin said not long back in 1968, we weren't talking about a few days. We weren't talking about a few months. We were just talking about not just our lifetime. We were talking about not long. You know, when the Bible says that God created the earth in seven days, the catch is, what was a day exactly? <laughs> and so, you know, we're, we're moving along. We've already made a couple of big victory stops, right? This train has already had victory stops here in Colorado and in Washington, and that's only two states out of 50. So how long is it going to take to finish that journey? How long? Not long, because, because the ju <laughs> that's right, because the train of justice, the train of justice is rolling now, and we have another victory stop scheduled in Uruguay. In just in just a couple of weeks, and as Ethan said. That's one country out of 200, and that's only marijuana reform. So how long will it take to complete that journey? Not long. No, not long. And so I ask you, as I asked you two years ago, and which you have more reason to answer with more enthusiasm this time than last time, how long will it take for our train of justice to complete its journey? How long? Not long? I couldn't quite hear you. How long? Not long! Because the train is rolling now, right? The train is rolling now. How long? Not long. How long? Not long. We are on that train, and the train is headed home, and I welcome you to the end of our beginning. Thank you, Ira. Thank you.